Hello. I write my own scripts for fun and also uh, read scripts from first and foremost from amateur scripts, just um, scripts uh, posted online that are not made into movies, written by amateurs. And the quality of amateur scripts are not that high, actually. It's pretty low on average, of course, because if everyone is writing and you read everything, then the average is pretty low. I try to read what I think is interesting, and if I can, I can get over the first three pages without really being irritated, then I, I know that I can probably finish the script. But yeah, from the first three pages, you usually know, even by, I mean, even from the first page, you pretty much know what the quality will be of the script. I can pretty much read a script, reading one page, the first page of the script, I can read it nearly as I would from having read the full thing. Because your, your quality of a writer is... Is, it's not something you can hide. It's something that you show on the on the on the on the page, right? So this his quality as a writer, David Cook, is shown right away here. We see it right away, and we know we know this is a professional writer. This is like a writer who sells scripts for millions of dollars. You can see the quality right away from the first page. I can al already say, okay, this is. This is some this is a quality product and you can buy this product because it's quality. So but um, there are also some amateur scripts that are better than this panic room script by David Cook. And um, yeah, they have not been made into a movie, but there's a lot of stuff going on in buying a movie and producing a movie. For example, this script was bought for four million dollars by Sony. And I will probably rate it seven, maybe seven and a half from a fr out of ten stars. So it's a really, really good script. It's a strong script, but when I saw this number, four million, I don't know if it's correct. It's Wikipedia, but whatever. I was kind of surprised because, I mean, my scripts are not that much worse than this one. It's not like. I mean, if this one is four million, then surely I would say sell scripts for thousands of dollars, and I don't do that. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of other stuff involved uh, involved here, and I've also seen scripts better than this one. They have no that no one is are interested in. So, I don't know. You, you need to kind of be famous. You need to have connections, and you need to know to have a brand, and people need to trust your product too. And also the movie was made for $48 million and made a ton of profit. This is a good profit. I think you need to make twice the money in box office to make a profit. And it made about four times the money in the box office. Plus I assume it, uh, it does really, really well on Netflix and stuff like that because it's a, it's a short movie, it's a fast movie. And it's also a good concept good spec script concept where you, some intruders are going into a house but it's not I don't think it's R rated so it's kind of for everyone and there's this horror element in it but it's not gross and it's not gore so I think it's a, it's a, it's a great movie it's a great idea and this is the guy who wrote it David Cook or whatever his name is he wrote Jurassic Park, Sturf Ergo's really good movie Spider-Man, Mission Impossible stuff like that also wrote um, the mummy but some of these scripts are wrote, uh, written by several people because when you are making a script for a big studio that's part of a franchise then usually you have a ton of people involved in it and you also have very clear storyline that you need to write about oh he also wrote uh, Jack Ryan 2 is not as good as the first one but still Yeah, very interesting. As you can see, he started in in eighty eight, so it makes sense that he in two thousand, while already being a famous, very famous writer and having written Toy Stories, and st <laughs> that becomes a Jurassic Park. I have not seen this, but I've heard a lot of things about this movie, Mission Impossible stuff like that. Then Snake Eyes, that's that's okay, pretty interesting movie. 
Uh, so it makes sense that he's already a famous writer because he made a lot of famous movies, sold a lot of scripts, and now he can sell a script for four million dollars. And you kind of need all these years to get into this industry. So you need a lot of experience, a lot of years as a writer to become good. I don't know how many years, maybe 10 years or something. I don't know. But yeah, you need to kind of not earn anything. And then at some point, if you have a huge talent, then you can start selling stuff. But there's a very small possibility of you having a career path in, in screenwriting. And let's see how he does it. The film is short, this film is fast. I really, really like this intro. So comparing it to the movie, of course, you don't see the stuff in the movie. You, you just start in the movie itself. And usually in the script, you don't have this introduction stuff. You just uh, start with the fade in or just with the first scene. And then with, uh, you end with at the end. But here he added something more and something weird that I usually don't see in scripts and I don't know if this was converted to PDF so maybe this is a special script or something like that but I, I actually started to, to add stuff like this to my scripts because sometimes a script can be long for example if it's 100 um, let's say 60 pages long but it's really really fast then maybe it's only two hours long as a movie usually one page is one minute right so even though it's a lot of pages long it can still be a shorter shorter movie so that's really really important to know because when you are selling a product as a producer you want to know what you have so now you know okay this is not as long as movie as the page count is and also of course this this is kind of taken out usually you see at the page you see at the pages and know how long it is the movie but when you have stuff like this added in the script then of course you have like five seconds or ten seconds here that are that are not moving and also he's illustrating it again that this is a fast script by saying uh, for one second we see the Manhattan skyline literally for another second for another second no time wasted admiring the scenery I don't know, with uh, David Fincher who directed the movie, who also made Fight Club and stuff like that. He is um, someone who likes a steady cam, who likes to focus on the scenery. So I cannot remember if the movie also showed this, this stuff for a few seconds. I don't think so. I think uh, actually he started the movie by showing a lot of scenery and then also um, had a name of the production and directors and actors and stuff like that in into the scenery it was really really great in the movie masterly done much better than this and at the beginning of course there's some action with the, the daughter playing basketball she's Sarah only eight years old in the movie she's uh, no nine years old I think you can see it where's Sarah usually it's Sarah this is the first time we see her mentioned, so cap all caps are like letters. And nine year old girl. In the movie she is a bit older, so you can kind of feel that in the movie she should not have been as old because a lot of the time she is reactive and not very proactive. But in this script she feels more proactive because she's a small girl, so everything she does and reacts to kind of feels mature for her age. While in the movie, um, you are not that surprised by her reacting and doing stuff because, yeah, that's kind of what we we, we kind of expect a girl to uh, to be proactive when she's attacked. At least a more mature girl. And as you see here, this uh, no, you you cannot see it here, of course, but uh, all this is is good writing. From the first page, I can already see if a script is good or not good. So from page one, pretty much always, I can pretty, I know pretty much how I will rate the script. And of course, from this page one, I already see the quality in the script. You can just, you can read a page, any page from this script, and you know its quality. So that's also what I, what I do with amateur scripts. I kind of read the first page, and then see if it's okay. 
if the per first page interests me a lot, if the formatting is great, if everything is well put together, then I know it's quality script. And then I'll reach, read page two and three and see if the quality uh, the quality remains. But usually from one page, you can also you can uh, pretty much know what kind of product it is and the quality. And yeah, you may not believe it if you don't read scripts, but it, it's actually true. You can pretty much spend maybe 30 seconds on a script and pretty much know the level of quality of the writing. Maybe you won't like the story, but you know that it will be a quality script if the first page is quality and you know that it will sell and become a, a movie that's very much liked. He does uh, do some weird stuff at time to time. For example, at one point they both say stuff at the same time, both Sarah and her mom, Mac, and instead of doing dual dialogue, he uh, puts them one on the another and then he just explains that, as, that they are saying it at the same time. Also here you have like, uh, 30, you, you have like, Yeah, this is 14 minutes into the movie, maybe a bit shorter, that not, not much has happened in the, um, the horror. So we have some, some kind of action scene with the door shutting and Mac panicking in the small rooms because he, she has claustrophobia. We have uh, some basketball scenes, elevator scenes, and we have a great shot of the house, for example, in the movie, and it's also in the script. But in, it took a few months to make because they had to spend nine days filming a camera in every room, going through every room. And then in post-production, they had to make it seamless so that the camera would go through, um, through windows, doors and ceilings and uh, walls and stuff like that. So even making a one minute scene or like 30 second scene, it could take a few months in the studio because you need to make it seamless. You need to camera, have the camera float through the house and that can take a lot of time. And this was done in this movie and I think there are several scenes where the camera go through the, through the floor. And of course this is also made in about the year 2000. So that was really hard to make. So it's easier to write in the script than it is to make. But still you build a house um, I don't know if I've already said it, but you build, this is good because you build one house for a few million dollars and then you can film the scenes, scene for scene. So the first scene, let's say the robbers, they destroy something in the house. Well, then the next day you wake up and then you film the next scene and you already have the destruction in the house. So then you just continue doing that until the house is pretty much destroyed and you have filmed everything you need. also much much easier than flying around and filming in a school or an office building and stuff like that this is just one scene so you build one house you film it in there and you know where to work and you know where everyone is you know how you want ev everything to be like and you know where the camera needs to go so everything is set up perfectly Yeah, this is pretty much like the movie, but there's, uh, there's a few things that kind of make uh, I would, if I was commenting on the script, for example, if he sent it to me and wanted my comments on the script, then I will uh, comment on a few things. I think his language use and uh, his understanding of how a house works and stuff like that is really, really great, much, much greater than, than mine, because of course you have studied this, this subject before writing the script. You kind of need to study it for a few months. So, for example, if you're writing a script about monitors and a dude making monitors or a company making monitors, you probably need to read a lot of guides about how monitors is made, read about physics, mathematics and stuff like that. And then you can write the script. So this is clearly what he did here. There's a lot of interesting knowledge about how stuff works in the, in the house, especially with the with phones and also about 
um, medicine and stuff like that. So he clearly read up on a ton of things and knew a lot of things to write the script. You need to know a lot about everything because you have characters from all over the world interacting from all over kind, from all kind of societies and cultures and you pretty much need to know it all as a scriptwriter otherwise you won't make a good product and there's one scene where, where Mac the mother is in a panic room when she kind of imagines that she's in a central park in New York and that scene for me in the script at least it didn't really work because when you have this horror element or this claustrophobic element in the movie and you suddenly have has a, have a scene in the park. She's just imagining she's in the park because she's panicking. But still, it kind of takes me out of this um, claustrophobic setting. So sometimes it's not a good thing to to pull the viewer out of the setting because you spent a lot of pages on creating the setting, on creating the fear, creating the claustrophobia. So then. Um, a flashback or a dream or an imagination of a scene can take, can take the viewer a bit out of the movie. That would be one of my of the, the feedback stuff I would uh, give the writer to look into that and how he sees that scene. And also this, this script feels much much slower than the movie. The movie really improved a lot of scenes at least at the end. With this script you kind of feel like at page 90 it's really really pick up picks up pace and kind of gets to the ending and the end fights but in the movie it felt like it was the last third of the movie it didn't come right at the end so we didn't just see them come out of the panic room at the very end that's at least not how i remember the movie because it was paced very differently with here you see them the final interaction very very late into the movie i mean page 90 is pretty much where many movies are already uh, done or and finished here the cops come so already if it's a short and fast movie then where's the 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 final fight why is it not come about yet also raul uh, says a lot of direct things like she saw my face the kid too and he continues saying that he wants to kill the kids and it's too on the nose in the movie it's easier to cut out some of the scenes where he's talking about what he wants to do because sometimes you can just have one scene and then you know the viewer has understood it because the scene is very focused on his face for example if we focus on the camera focuses on his face for five seconds and then he says she saw my face the kid too and he says it in a in a voice that means he wants to kill them then you don't need all the other dialogue lines but of course here in the script the writer doesn't know what kind of quality of the of the director will produce the script so maybe he feels that he needs to spell out some of the stuff so Raul repeats some stuff and Burham the he's play he's a black robber in the movie here he is uh, just a white guy, but also he's um, much more mean here. So uh, he's more in the movie. He's his role is much much better made because he's more calm and collected and the clever individual. But here he is both calm and collected and clever, but he also kind of has no great problems with killings. Not as great as he had in the movie. And he also much more proactive and aggressive towards uh, the people. For example, he, he shouts that he wants to get into the panic room. And here on the script, it feels like he's really aggressive. And he's kind of he's kind of leading the group to continue the mission. But in the movie, it felt like he was just a guy in a bad situation. That okay. And now Raul was brought into this mission. So now he had an asshole around him that he usually wouldn't have. So we really felt for him in the movie and felt that he was brought into a difficult situation. Where here we feel like he's an asshole and he kind of, he kind of at least deserves to go to prison. But even him dying wouldn't be a big problem. And he does die. 
at the end there's the ending really uh, firstly it comes really really late in the script but also that sarah he goes she uh, no not sarah the, the mother mac she goes into the neighbor's house let's see where she, she does that yeah she she goes into i, I don't think i saw this in the movie she goes into the neighbor's house and then she um, she knocks down the wall so while the neighbor is complaining, she uh, she knocks a hole in in the wall to the panic room because there are no steel barriers uh, at the neighbor's side. And again, once you do that, once you have Mac breaking into the panic room and starting shooting with her gun, trying to kill these two kidnappers, you have a problem because again, you moved away from the setting that you have created. You have created this panic room that no one can break into. And then right at the end, you kind of broke this tension because now we see that, okay, these robbers could have broken into the panic room. They would just need to subdue the neighbor who's an old lady. That's not really a problem, right? They, they could tie her up or whatever, have her, their mask on and then just break into the panic room. And the people inside the panic room cannot escape. This is what Meg did and she's just a woman so she doesn't even have the tools, equipment or the strength to do it as fast and effectively as they would have done it. So that's something I really would point out to the writer of the script that maybe the ending can be made better and the final fight could also be set in the, in the house itself because we should just have steel barriers on all sides of the panic room to really make it unpenetrable. I mean, they, they really need, we really need to understand that these robbers didn't have any other choice than doing what they did. It, it doesn't make sense that at the end they say, well, at one side there's no steel barrier. Okay, yeah, but I mean, why, why did that not uh, feature in the planning of, of all of the events? And there's no great final fights um, in the script, but you also feel that in the movie it doesn't really work. I mean, it is, it doesn't ruin the movie, but it really brings it down for me because the final fight is super, super silly with Raul fall, falling down the stairs and then he's still not dead and he's still coming up and still can fight. And they take a lot of time to bring him down and kill him. That for me is kind of really weird because it doesn't, it feels like an action movie at that point and really silly action movie and everything is badly, not, not well written, but it's better written than we see here in this script. So I kind of see that it, now I see it as an improvement of the story, even though it's clearly not, not great writing, it's silly writing. But, but it's also understandable because they kind of needed to put it on, on the story. They kind of needed to change the, the end a bit uh, right before filming. So usually when you don't have this half a year or many, many months to write a great script and a great ending, then the changes will come more fast and be made by maybe someone who didn't write the script. So it's kind of understandable that the ending doesn't really, the end fight is kind of silly and doesn't really work. Um, what else? What else? Yeah, I think that's, that's some, this is some of the difference I saw that kind of Raul and Burham, the black robber and the murderous guy, they're kind of too similar to each other because Burham is too proactive. He also wants to to get into the panic room. He he's not as much forced into it as he was in the movie, and he also screaming. Also, Raul tells him directly that he pretty much needs to kill the kid and the and the um, the mother, and Burham doesn't really react to it. He kind of ignores it. So we feel that he is a really big asshole here, and that of course will also be my comment to the script to the writer if he has sent it to me back in 2000 that okay there's a problem here because it's not a problem as such it's still a great script uh, it's a seven seven and a half but 
make it an eight and to make it an eight you need to tighten up a few things improve a few things if burham is um, more an antithesis to Raul, it could make work much much better because of Murham. Burham is just this nerdy guy who just down on his luck. He kind of forced into this situation and he feels forced because he really really needs money while Raul is this psychopath killer. And also Raul could, um, could not speak as much in the movie, it feels like he's speaking much less and it makes it more menacing, more um, it, it feels like he's um, a mystery guy, a mystery killer. Where here he's just a crazy guy from drive a uh, bus driver. Also with the cops, you have two cops. I really, actually, really like this. In the movie, it's it's a fantastic scene, but um, two cops showing up. It's more. Um, it feels more realistic because one guy showing up asking why she called 911 it's it does make sense but why are there not two cops why is one guy responsible for all of it what if he doesn't do his job well so having two cops makes it more realistic and i think maybe that um, david fincher wanted to make the scene more intimate and slower paced so he didn't want to have the second cop because now the, t the two cops can joke around and stuff like that and in the movie it feels more claustrophobic because we are focusing on the small singular interactions I don't know if this would have been more uh, this would just have been a different scene uh, a more realistic scene maybe even a better scene but it would have had another effect on the movie But yeah, I, I don't know what scripts are selling for. I know that if I think if I wrote the script in, back in 2000, of course, I wouldn't sell it for four million dollars. That's that's 100 percent sure. But I, I don't even think I could. I don't even know if I could sell it at all um, because I don't know how scripts sell. Most scripts don't sell. Right. Even the good ones I read, they don't really sell. I mean. People like to read them and they see the quality in them, but you still need someone to to have um, fifty million dollars who they they want to spend on the mo on the story, and for that they need to know that the story can sell. So, for example, if you write a fantastic script about a panic room today, then maybe if the studios look at the movie industry and what the viewers want. And they see that the viewers don't are not really interested in panic room movies or movies set in claustrophobic settings then they won't buy your script and maybe uh, in five years time then people are interested in panic rooms and then suddenly your script is bought for four million dollars i don't know how it works exactly but uh, yeah I, I do see some problems in the script um, and i would have uh, commented on some of this stuff and ask about it also, he has some jokes in the script, for example, and some explanations of stuff. For example, the the night lamp in Sarah's room is uh, Powerpuff Girls, I think, and that again, it's it's a bit weird detail to add. I mean, it doesn't really tell me anything. It's not really interesting, and I don't really uh, know why it's important to the story. So he has like a small explanation details about. This is fine because this is explanation of the house, but then he has an explanation of, I mean, I don't know, a lot of small things that kind of take up space. And usually I just remove that from my script. So I say if, if she has a Powerpuff Girl lamp, that's fine for her. But if it's not really important to the plot, then let the director or the set designers choose the lamp. Let's see what else. Uh, the panic room door is used very, very well. 
the action scenes are very well structured and sometimes you notice really clever things in the script that's i mean i can go a bit more in detail now because i explained all the basics but if i have to be a bit nerd about it there's a lot of uh, plot elements that can be used again and again for example uh, that sarah is diabetic so the medicine stuff is used again and again and at the beginning we only see her watch so even the script we just see she just says sarah looks at her watch what kind why is why is she doing this he, he kind of asks asking us about it for example here i'm human what do you want me to do hide it this is not a dialogue line this is um this is a line made to illustrate us or made made to tell us uh, what the what the scenery is and what the acting is and he, he uses these kind of questions to illustrate that there's something we don't know for example sarah looking at her watch we know that we need to notice it because she's doing it at a weird time but we don't know what the watch is and then later we discover that this is a diabetic watch so she's watching her blood sugar and her insulin in the body i think and then we know when the numbers go down that's a problem because she overextended herself physically and now she needs um, she needs uh, these, this medicine to survive and i don't know if i would have done it the same way in the script but in the movie it needs to be like this where we kind of discover stuff and how stuff are structured but he did the same thing in the script because i think he's um, he's maybe watching the movie in his head while he writes it so he's trying to recreate the scenes in his head scene for scene even telling us how long a scene needs to, um, to last or how we need to feel about a scene and stuff like that so a bit um, a bit pointing out to the director how he needs to create this movie and i don't do that because i don't know which kind of director would be interested in my my scripts so i cannot direct him uh, uh, my favorite um, some of my favorite scenes and some of the scenes that you really really feel are well written and i think are scenes that make the script sell for four million dollars are scenes where they for example do technical stuff like um, mac the mother is trying to connect her the phone in the panic room to the main telephone line because she know the main telephone line is hooked up and the panic room telephone line is not hooked up so she is now trying to connect the phone to the to the main line from the panic room and Burham, the robber who built the panic room he kind of hears something in the panic room and he right away understands that she's trying to connect the phone and then right away he asks the stupid uh, junior kid who whose grandfather owns the house he asks him about it and he asks did you really do what i told you to do did you really break the telephone box or whatever or did you just shut off the telephone and then he has to admit that he fucked up so burham now to now needs to run into the basement and destroy the telephone box the way he told the the grandchild to destroy it so we see Mac trying to do something super clever that I would never have figured out to do what how to do because I don't even have a telephone at home. I have a cell phone, right? And we see Burham figuring out that she wants to do that. And also she, he's figuring out that this idiot that planned it all, of course, uh, could have fucked up and not have done what he told him to do. So we see a lot of stuff here going on and we see him. Um, a protagonist being super clever trying to solve the problem defeat the antagonist but we also see the antagonist being super clever and then one up the protagonist who is trying to um, call the police and this is some masterful writing and ma and this is also writing i expect from every single script i read with this kind of setting if there's an antagonist and protagonist we need this kind of fight if you don't have this kind of fight then i mean burn your script throw it out the window because we need it we need clever individuals to to fight and fight on a 
fair arena where the antagonists are stronger than the protagonist, but the protagonist reacts and learns, and then the antagonists react and learn too, and then they evolve and become more clever and fight in this kind of way. And that's essential for a script if you want to write such a story, because if you don't have these kind of scenes, then I will just, I would not enjoy your script. It needs to be up at that level to be considered good. And that's where you, where you become good and that's where you sell a product. And there was a lot of, another clever scene. I mean, this medicine stuff was clever because we kind of discovered it along the way. And the way the panic room is set up and how it functions is very clever. The camera settings are clever. Oh, the, the most, um, the scene that I really, really think sold the script and that I think is fantastic writing is where the bad guys, Burham, he, he tells the Raul, Raul has a gun on Burham, tells Burham, I will shoot you in three seconds if you don't uh, have a plan to get into the panic room. And they already have kidnapped the father, so he, he ha they have him, but they cannot get into the panic room still. So now Raul is counting down. It's a really effective uh, means to create tension in the movie. Crank, count it now. I'll shoot you in three seconds. Three, two, one. And then Burham responds that he has a plan. They go up to the panic room, to the room where the panic room is, but next to it. And then they start to, um, Raul starts to beat up the dad, right? So now he's, uh, they are telling them, if you don't come up, we'll just torture your dad until you come out. So you will have to come out. But of course, um, Meg can still not get out of the room because she has a daughter there. So she knows that if they go out, then she probably will put her, her daughter's life on the line. And she knows that even the father wouldn't want that to happen. So she knows she must stay in the room. But now Burham does something uh, weird. He puts his jacket over the camera because he says that he fears that um, the mother will see, uh, no, the daughter will see her father getting beaten to death. So that's what he says to us, right? And that's what they see in the panic room that he kind of feels bad about it. This father being killed and he doesn't want the daughter, Sarah, to see the father being killed. He puts a jacket over the camera. And now the two people in the panic room thinks that he's kind of a good guy and he just wants them to not see that. In reality, they're setting up a plan. They're making sure that Raul can get into the father's clothes and the father is getting into Raul's clothes. I think, or Burham's clothes. Something like that. Or Burham is getting into... Uh, yeah, now I'm confused, but whatever. They are... They are um, they are putting the, they are lying on the bed with the father's clothes, right? So now when the jacket comes off the camera, we see that there's someone on the bed, but they will think that that's their father because he has this clothes on. And they will just think he's dead or something and just not uh, really focus that much on him. And on the on also on the cameras in the panic room, they see that um, Burham is sitting on a chair beaten up. So he's tied to a chair and beaten up. And they think it's Burham because he has Burham clothes on. In reality, they have switched clothes, right? So in reality, this scene is tricking the two people in the panic room to come out of the panic room. Because now they think that all the, all the bad guys are far gone and destroyed and beaten down. And in reality, Burham, that was Burham's plan all along to trick them into coming out not torching the father by by creating this kind of interesting and uh, very deep and clever plan and that's uh, that's really really great screen screenwriting and that's amazing screenwriting actually fantastic screenwriting i mean i, I didn't I, I didn't explain it very well at all i explained it in a terrible way but if you see the movie you will see what i mean and uh, if you want to write a script that's worth anything, you need to include a few scenes of this kind of uh, caliber where someone is cheating someone else and they the other, then we think it's gone wrong, but actually they 
they mean, meant it to, to, to go wrong because they're setting up another plan. So um, seven and a half out of 10 stars, um, great script, much better movie. Thank you.